is um, remarks and um, the perspective from the superintendent of instruction. We also um, invited the superintendent or somebody from her staff to address us today. Um, they also declined to be here. Specifically, the superintendent said she was going to be traveling. She did include a letter um, that is also in your folder. Um, we did invite um, candidates for the superintendent of instruction if they wanted to share. We had one volunteer, Mr. Durst, um, wanted to share. So Mr. Durst, please um, come up, introduce yourself. We'll get your presentation pulled up, Brooke. Do you have his presentation? Excellent. And we are a little bit short on time, but thank you. And flip your uh, microphone on, please. Introduce yourself and rock and roll. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. My name is Brandon Durst, and I am here to uh, provide a, a very brief um, uh, presentation around, uh, just to provide a little more depth around the statutory framework for um, how curriculum is adopted, and then also to provide some anecdotes as to the potential pitfalls around our current process here in the state of Idaho. I'm not going to try to duplicate too much what Brooke just did. She did a great job going through that. So I'll go through those as quickly as I can, but um, would be happy to answer some questions when we get there. So let me start off with just kind of providing a 30,000 foot view of what the state superintendent's position looks like from a statutory standpoint. So there's four uh, essential parts of this um, within statute title 6715. I put, do they have this, Brooke, in their packets, the handouts? I, I provided some handouts, or there should be some handouts with have all the statutes. Um, so you guys can look at them yourselves. Uh, it'd be helpful to be illuminating as to what you're doing. Uh, but uh, there's a couple of them in particular that I want to highlight that I think is very important. Uh, one of them is around, I'll start at the bottom and work my way up from the slides. But if you look at 67.1507, uh, one of the responsibilities of the superintendent of public instruction is to inspect schools. And part of that looks like looking at what they're doing, you know, and uh, the language is very interesting um, because when it talks about inspecting schools, it talks about things that may be of public interest related to curriculum and those sorts of things. And so I think that if we're looking around issues around um, uh, indoctrination or issues that might be potentially um, problematic to families and parents, those are certainly issues where the state board, or pardon me, the superintendent should should be and is is charged um, by statute to be a participant, and so uh, that is a uh, a major piece to me. Uh, the other thing is obviously the superintendent is the only member of the state board of education that's actually elected. Um, there's seven appointed members, one member that's elected. They're an ex officio member, but they have full voting rights, um, and so they're the only member of that board, which you just heard has a lot of hands in the education policy space. They're the only ones that you can actually vote in or vote out, but depending upon what they're doing. So I think that that's, that's pretty important when it comes to the role. Um, they also meet with local superintendents, you know, to talk about a lot of different things, one of which could be the curriculum that's being adopted. And obviously we're talking around, you know, what, uh, what curriculum is being adopted and how that aligns with standards. The state superintendent has a, has a, should have a very strong role in voicing this, the, the opinion of the state when it comes to those issues. And, and part of that could be, in, in, could include um, representing any public policy interests or public policy positions that the state legislature has created as well. So if you refer back to the last legislative session, the legislature passed House Bill 377, which sought to curb some of these issues around indoctrination. And certainly the state superintendent would have a role to make sure that those things are being done at the district level as well. So. Uh, this is just a real quick flow chart. You guys can see how this works. Um, technically, curriculum starts at the legislature. I know a lot of people don't talk about that, but that is legally the case. Uh, things don't just become, let, let me correct myself, things shouldn't just uh, appear out of thin air. They should have a statutory basis for them. And so uh, whether or not that happens or not in real practice is a separate question. Going back to some questions that I've heard from the from the panelists or from the task force members today. But, oh, um, but that's, uh, that's a separate question. But the reality is that you should have a, uh, a, an authorizing statute to make something happen. So, um, and then you go, to your, you go to your rule, and then you go to your local board, which then, then actually adopts curriculum. But the, the, the thing that's interesting, and I think that needs to be highlighted here, and I'll get into this in a little bit more in a second, 
is that the, the local board policies, while they are independently created, they have to follow statutory authority and they have to follow the framework of the rule. And if they don't do either one of those things, those policies are, and those curriculum are inappropriate. And so, so as to say, well, we have a local district a a model here in Idaho. That's true in part, but it is also the case that the state board and the state superintendent as a member of the state board has a significant role to play in terms of approving what those things look like. Brooke, can you go to the next slide for me, please? Uh, so this is the statute, and, and Brooke kind of referred to it earlier, but the course of study curriculum materials, this is the actual statute here the legislature passed, uh, 33 uh, 118. It refers to how this is done. And I'll, you can scroll one at a time. It kind of highlighted some stuff. Um, so it says this, this, is, this is important language. And so for those of you that haven't uh, spent too much time listening to the legislature before, this is going to be very helpful, I hope. But whenever the legislature uses the word shall, that's important. Uh, that means it's not a choice. Um, it means that they're supposed to do it and there's not another option. So if you read here, it says the state board shall prescribe the minimum courses and to be taught in the public elementary and secondary schools. And it goes on to say that it prepares, it provides uh, the, the guidance for what that's supposed to look like. So if any, any curriculum that a school district that may want to, to uh, any curricula that the school district may want to adopt, it has to comport with this part of the statute. And this is the important piece to this is, from a statu from a uh, legal framework, we go in uh, steps from a hierarchy. We start from the Constitution, we go down to the statutes, then we go to the rule, and then we go to board policy. So as to say, so if a school district has a policy that's contrary to the statute, or if an administrative rule is contrary to the statute, the statute wins. Just as if the Constitution said something different than a statute, the Constitution wins. So. Um, So they, then they go here and they say that it shall determine how and under what rules uh, curricular materials shall be. So, so here's the question that we say, so what are we doing with things like critical race theory, right? How do we deal with that? Well, clearly here in 3318 subpart two, the state board has the authority along with the state superintendent as a member of that board to create rules that guide how materials are, what materials are collected. Right, so if they wanted to say tomorrow, for example, if the state board wanted to say we're not going to allow for critical race theory to be taught in public schools in Idaho, they're well within their rights from a statutory perspective to do that. Continue, please. Mm -hmm. uh, the board of uh, trustees, of, and then it goes. Then the final part here is the trustees are allowed to to adopt may. So this is the difference, and I want you to. Uh, this is critical here. They use the word may in subsection four, whereas you recall in subsection two they use the word shall. So this is, the, this is the actual power dynamic between how curriculum is adopted and how it should not be adopted. Shall is much more powerful than may when it comes to a legal context. Uh, so this is, I just have these other two things. 33113, uh, limits of instruction. Again, statutorily, we have the ability to limit instruction within the state board. That is what is taught, how it is taught. That is a statutory, that is, that is language that, that, that the legislature deemed was appropriate for the state board to have that authority. So as to say, well, it's the school district's choice. That's the, we're going to just pass the buck to them. That's inappropriate because the statute says something quite different. Uh, again, we, and Brooke already went over this. This is 33118A uh, addresses the process by which these materials are collected. But I would point out that you can also see, again, the state board and the state superintendent as part of that board has a significant part to play in approving curriculum adoption. Uh, I'm going to kind of get through these fast. Again, we see uh, the rules governing authority, uh, governing thoroughness, which uh, Brooke just talked about. This is, again, common core standards, or what uh, would be referred to as Idaho content standards. Uh, we have assessments in public schools, and I, I wanted to highlight this one. It says, assist, assist school districts in evaluating local curriculum and instructional practices in order to make needed curriculum adjustments. That's a role that the state board has. And I think that's, in, that, that's very instructive, it's saying, they have the right to step in and say, is this cutting the mustard? And if it isn't, we're going to provide you guidance on how to get it to the place where it can comport to our standards. Uh, and then again, you saw that, that you have in your, your packets the material selection piece. Go ahead. Uh, 
Okay, so the next thing I want you to do oops, is uh, look at this. You can go to the next slide. Is looking at the dangers of incorporating by reference. So uh, if you have your packet, you can look at this, uh, uh, the rules governing, uh, governing thoroughness. And you'll see uh, there a reference to ELL and ELD lang uh, language. And it says that we're. Can you show us where? Because we have several pages here, sure. if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, let me pull it up on my phone. Yeah, no problem. Maybe the page number? Yep, I'll get it to you. Just a sec. Yep. So if you look at the sixth, uh, the seventh, or I guess it's the sixth page, or eighth page. It says page six at the bottom. I just merged this all together. But it's the eighth page of the of the packet, which is it says page six, IDAPA 080203. If you look at that, uh, it talks about subsection zero two, English language development. Okay? So in this, so the legislature to cut corners, we talked asked there was a question from Reverend Wilson whether or not they ever cut corners in doing things. One of the ways we do that is by incorporating by reference. Why do we do that? Because for A, it's a lot easier because somebody else is doing the work and we don't have to do it. And B, it makes the rules not so cumbersome. Here's the problem. This is a good example. So in subsection two, we talk about English language development. It says the world-class instructional design and assessment, WIDA 2012 English language development. This is, this is, this is a this is the this is the content standard that's being taught in Idaho that was incorporated by reference. So let's look at what WIDA believes in and how it relates to this task force. So you can see this here first. This is a tweet that WIDA sent out. I also created a put in the back of your packet. There's two letters that they have drafted. You can read those at your leisure, and you'll see what I'm talking about here. Uh, WIDA is significantly invested in critical race theory. They're very supportive of anti-racism uh, measures and can continue again. Oh, back to that one. Uh, here's another example of another tweet where they talk about their anti-racism resources. And here's the, here's the thing as a parent of five kids that made me angry. Racism, anti-racism resources available for all ages. Now tell me if a child is born and no child isn't born racist, why does a three-year-old need to know what it means not to be racist? Unless that behavior is being modeled by somebody else in their lives, they don't need to have instructions to be figure out. It's, it's, it's similar to the Garden of Eden and saying, well, all of a sudden, we don't, we're unclothed, right? Like, you didn't know it until you knew it, right? Until somebody pointed it out to you. So, um, so here's another one. You can go to the next piece. Uh, so this is another example of what they're doing. This is them promoting a... Uh, a group. That gal in the top left corner, Bettina, I think is her name, right? Bettina is, she, uh, she is, you should research that gal. She loves critical race theory. In fact, all those four do. And this is stuff that these folks are, are promoting. We are, the state of Idaho is a member state of this organization. Your taxpayer dollars fund this operation. Did you know that? We are, we are subjugating our ability as a state, our content standards that we're giving to our children are being subjugated to a group whose values and missions do not align with Idaho statute or Idaho values. That to me is problematic. You can, can continue, please. So Madam my conclusion Chair, here is just to tread properly. Madam Chair, please forgive my interruption, but uh, if I may, could you please restate what you just said? Ryan, maybe j about what? Because he just said a lot. <laughs> about taxpayer dollars. Uh, so what I said, thank you for the, for the interruption. So what I said is, your taxpayer, as Idaho is, is a member of WIDA, and WIDA is promoting these concepts which are contrary to not only Idaho statute, but Idaho values, and we're paying for it. And my question is whether or not that's something that's acceptable to you or not. Because as a parent and as a taxpayer, it's not. Um, and so for me, and I believe that the state of Idaho needs to be reflective. This is a serious issue. You know, what happens in our kids' schools is a serious issue. The content that goes into the children's minds is a serious issue. And we need to be serious when we look at these things. We need to recognize that, you know, we can't uh, be all things to all people. And we need to recognize that maybe Idaho is a little different than other states, and that's a good thing. And so, um, you know, I don't want my taxpayer dollars paying for this, and I'm sure that many of you feel the same way, and I suspect that if we 
asked a majority of Idahoans, they would agree with that sentiment as well. So my last statement is just that we need to tread carefully. Incorporating by debt reference is, is a great idea. And let me just kind of end this with an illustration as again to why this is problematic. Let's say you were in the electrical trade. And we, by the way, incorporate by reference in our electrical trade stuff all the time. We do it by the International Building Code. Well, what if they decided they're going to change things? They're going to require every house in the state of Idaho to be ran with 220 volt wire. You know how much that would increase the cost of electricity in the state of Idaho? Exponentially. Well, that's what we're happening, except that's, that's, that's a silly little thing about money. This is a big thing about children's brains and their minds and their values. And I would say this is, this is an important thing to do and it's something we need to take seriously. And so I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Durst. Excellent presentation and overview and to really drill into some of the concerns from the um, State Superintendent of Instruction's perspective. I'm sure there are several questions. Let's start here with um, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you, Madam Chair and Brandon. Thanks again for being here. This is really interesting. This is exactly the type of thing that we wanted to really get drilled down into and understand how this works. You mentioned that taxpayers' dollars are being spent. Could you elaborate on that? Are we paying a membership fee to this organization? Have you verified that? So I haven't looked. I, I, the consortium is built off of member contribution. So uh, did I go to transparency.idaho.gov to confirm how that was being sent? No, I haven't done that yet. But based off of my research off of the web, off the WIDA website, they are um, funded by the states. And so I, I think that would be pretty clear indication that the states do participate, just as most other uh, state national member organizations you know, rely upon donate or contributions or, or dues paid from, from those states. OK, I'm sure we could find that out. Yeah. Easily. Thank you. Isaac. Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Durst, do you know if every school district or every school in Idaho is using WIDA? They have to be. Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Moffat, they would have to be. And the reason they have to be is because that's the content standard. <laughs> and to go back to the question about the, the Lieutenant Governor just asked, even if we're not paying membership dues, which I believe that we are, we're still paying for it because we're paying for their content standards. And, and local school districts are paying to utilize those content standards. And they don't give this stuff away for free. I mean, it does cost money, so we're, we're paying for it. I think, did I see, no, okay, Laura. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> so uh, I noticed WIDA uh, on some of the uh, web, Sites, it was underscored W U is that University of Washington or UW? No, they're actually based <laughs> so good Pacific Northwest perspective, right? Well, so UW means Washington. It's actually University of Wisconsin, Madison. Wisconsin, okay. Yeah. And do you know who specifically funded this or uh, authorized this to be part of the content standards? I think is there a it would name? have been approved by the State Board of Education. Do we know when that was approved? Uh, it would say in the pack, it should say the year that it was adopted. It says 2012. Yeah, 2012. Okay. All right, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Anna. Uh, thank you for your presentation. So over the course of this task force, we've talked about how critical race theory can be um, imposed in different school districts from varying levels. It can come from state board level, it can come from the uh, federal government, the state level and local level, and all the way from just ind individual teachers. Um, what kind of policy solutions do you think are necessary to solve this very deep-rooted problem? So I think that's a great question, Madam Chairman and um, Mrs. Miller. I think that the question goes down to, you typically want to do the policy solution at the lowest, lowest denominator, right? So you don't need a constitutional change to fix something in a district. In this particular case, the state board has it well within their, within their purview, statutory authority, to do something about that. And so if the state board of education tomorrow wanted to uh, cite a meeting and says we're going to end these things, they could end those things tomorrow. That would be well within their purview, and that would be the appropriate place to do it at, because they've already been granted the authority to do it from the legislature. Could the, leg could the legislature go pass a law and do it themselves? Of course they could. They're always within that right. That's part of the, their, their responsibility as legislative branch. 
But they could also delegate that authority to the, to, which they've already have delegated that authority to the to the administrative rule breaking process, and they could give that to state board and, and and the state board should. In fact, I would argue that House Bill three seventy seven indicated the wishes of the of the of the legislature, and the and the state board should be following those wishes to the legislative intent of those wishes. So, is that your question? Okay. Okay. Another one from Isaac. Madam Chair, Mr. Durst, didn't it the uh, legislators this year pass uh, a bill prohibiting critical race theory. So have they not already instructed the State Board of Education to get rid of it? So let me, uh, Madam Chairman, Mr. Moffat, the, the technical answer to that question is no. Uh, the, the legislature didn't pass a law to prohibit critical race theory. The legislature passed House Bill 377, which I was just referring to, that provides some guidance to school districts around funding for different um, types of, of, of theories. Did, but it did it ban it? No. So there's nothing prohibiting a private entity from coming in and paying for curriculum to be taught as long as it's not being paid for at the public expense. Uh, the state of Idaho has not taken the step of outright outlawing something or, or, provide, or prohibiting it from being taught. This is not a matter of, in my opinion, it's not a matter of being uh, censors, providing censorship of certain ideas, but at the same time, we wouldn't want to teach our children something that's destructive to our moral fabric of our society. And so it's important, I think, upon us, it's incumbent upon us to be able to recognize the really del uh, deleterious impact of this stuff and the way that it can divide our communities. And so recognizing it for what it is, just like we wouldn't want to treat teach white nationalism in our schools. We don't want to teach, you know, these things to tell people that they should be ashamed of their race, so. <laughs> Sorry. So, Reverend. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, could you give me the, the, full, the full address, the, the web address for, for, for the, the WIDA website? You may have already done that. I, I probably did not, but I can find it real fast. Well, then I can blame you instead of me. It is wida.wisc.edu. Thanks very much. Yeah. Mark. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Uh, Durst, this, this might be a more appropriate question to ask at, at 3.30. But I'll ask you, there, evidently there's a uh, instruction or training for new school board members. When someone's elected as a, a new board member in a district, I've heard that they go to some instruction. Is that a function of the State Board of Education, do you know, or the Department of Education, or who oversees what is taught there and who provides the instruction? Yeah, so this, uh, Madam Chairman, the, the answer to that question is it's neither it's the Department of Ed or the State Board. Uh, the State of Idaho does not require any training for new trustees or any trustees at all for school districts. That training is provided exclusively by the Idaho School Boards Association and the ISBA uh, offers that training to districts in exchange for them being members of their organization. Great. Laura? Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Durst, do you uh, know that if I went into my local school district and I wanted to see where this was manifesting itself, <laughs> would, it, would, would it say WIDA or would it be under other names? How would I recognize that this is there? It, Madam Chairman, um, you, would, you would have to, it probably wouldn't reference them by name. You would have to look at the content standard they're specifically teaching about, and then from there you could um, ascertain as to where it's coming from. We know that because they are the, uh, they are uh, incorporated by reference and they're identified by name that they're create they're providing that standard, right? So if you were to look at that specific standard, the ELD standard, then ELD, the ELD, ELD. Okay. that's who's driving, and we know that WIDA is the one that's responsible for providing that standard for the state of Idaho. Anything that's being provided is being based off of their guidance. Thank you. Great, Ryan. 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Durst. So I'm going to lean a little bit on your own past experience here. For the benefit of the, of the audience that may not know, you were an elected member of the Idaho legislature for several years. And so I'm going to lean on that a little bit. You were one of the guys making these shall and may laws. And so I understand that you as a legislator thought that you were actually getting things done, but from the perspective of the frustrated citizenry, it often seems like these different parties are kind of giving each other a wink and a nod, and there's a rule that says, shall, and then we get the Boise School District saying, eh, yeah, sort of. So my question is, and if it pleases Madam Chair, I'll have a follow-up after you respond, is what do we do about this? Do yeah. we, have, as private citizens, have to hire lawyers and file lawsuits? Or is this on state prosecutors to make these state agencies behave? So that's it, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. That's, a, that's, a, that's a big question. So uh, there's a, th a few things. I'll just tell you from a pol so my background, I have a master's degree in public policy. Right? So this is kind of my, my jam, is it in the current vernacular, right? Uh, I, from a policy formulation standpoint, the legis there's always a there's always an interesting balancing act at which point as to how much precision you put in the law and how much uh, um, latitude you put in the law for rulemaking. My personal opinion has always been that you should make things as prescriptive as possible because that prevents the sort of uh, bureaucratic um, game playing that happens and the things that frustrate um, regular Idahoans. Uh, so. The solution is, in my opinion, to, from an education policy standpoint, is to have a state board that hews more closely to the legislative intent of the folks that they elected. Uh, that could also mean having a state board that's elected. Um, and in my opinion, that's what should be done. But um, that's, but ultimately, we're talking about remedies, right? From a legal standpoint, we're talking about a remedy. And the remedy is to be able to find the actors that you have the most direct accountability over. And in this case, it's the legislature, so the legislature needs, and the governor's office. And in both those, because the governor appoints the state board, the legislators write the laws. And so, and the governor also appoints the agency heads, which then write the rules for these things. And so, it's important to um, identify who the accountability, who can be held accountable for these decisions, and to make sure that they understand that you want to have decisions made by people that are accountable and not by people who are not. Your follow-up? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So you're telling us that the governor and the legislature are responsible for fixing this, and we are spending a great deal of time explaining how our schools are not fixing this. So correct me if I'm wrong, but this isn't being fixed because our governor and many of our legislators are not fixing it. Madam Chairman, uh, I, here's, I would, let me put a finer tip on it. I think that's the ultimate result. But I would point to the citizens of Idaho that need to take some responsibility for who they're electing. And I would say that they need to make a decision as to what kind of government, what kind of state they want to live in, and let the decisions flow from there. Because at the end of the day, we're the ones that are in control of our own destiny. We don't live in an autocracy. We don't live in a monarchy. We live in, an, in a republic. And we have the opportunity, by the grace of God, to vote for people that will represent our views. And if that's something that we want to see different, if we want to fix our schools, as you put it out, then we need to elect people that are going to reflect that and what that looks like to be fixed. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Durst. Okay. Thank and you. Oh. Lieutenant Governor. Just a quick follow-up. I failed to also include that the members of the board are appointed by the governor, but they are also subject to confirmation by the Senate. Right. And so that's an additional form of accountability as these appointments go through to contact the senators. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Mr. Durst. Thank you. All right.